Hey friends, we're here at Build. Aren't you happy? Yeah. Are you ready to hear about, hear about some .NET? Come on, .NET. This is .NET. Yes. We've got a parade of machines that we need five different machines here. We've got me and we've got Casey in the audience who's going to come up. We've got three presenters and five computers. We have it all packed into 60 minutes. Yeah. All right, go. Let's go. <clears throat> How do so, we show the slides? This us on the screen. I don't want to see us. We're not interesting. The slides are interesting. Not me. It's, oh, I pushed the button. <laughs> I'm like mad at the guy in the back when it's my job to push the button. Hang on. That's us. Go. Awesome. Um, so we just want to show, you know, we open source.net core about two years ago, and this is just the commu community momentum we're seeing around .NET Core, which is really awesome. Uh, you can see these PRs from the community are ramping up at this huge rate. Um, and we have some great quotes from customers here. You know, Samsung, uh, they took a bet on, on .NET for their Tizen platform. We have a slide on that a little bit later on because uh, we're open source and we don't sue anybody. Um, it's true. True. Not today. Um, that's not good. Oh, you should, that's our boss. You should mute her. Yes. Here. <laughs> With all due respect, uh, quiet hours. There you go. Okay, so this is a really cool one. We, we were really happy with this one. Um, Stack Overflow did a survey this year, and they talked about uh, new frameworks, most wanted frameworks, and .NET Core being only a one-year-old framework. You can see it's number three in the first year. Um, and you can see over here on the, on the other side, for web developers, C-sharp is way up there at the top. So uh, we're very happy. Uh, C-sharp's growing in Stack Overflow, and so really, really happy about that to see the active growth of .NET. Um, this one I really love as well. If you look at Hacker News, uh, we are the most talked about technology at Microsoft and Hacker News. Um, and there's a couple of awesome customers I've got here as well. Uh, Raygun was a company that actually moved uh, some of their applications from Node.js uh, to .NET Core. And when they did, uh, you can see they went from 1,000 requests a second to 20,000 requests a second. That's just showing that uh, the performance work we're doing in .NET Core um, is paying off. Um, now, this, this whole talk is about building .NET for you guys. And a lot of this is based, uh, the stuff we're going to talk about today is feedback we got from customers and we drove directly into the platform. So I'm going to start with is, uh, this is a big one. Uh, customers have been asking for guidance for a while. So if you remember back years ago, we had this patterns and practices team at Microsoft that actually released these books on how to build awesome .NET applications. And uh, they don't do that anymore. They, don't, they, work, they work somewhere else now. And uh, uh, so we as a team are going to take that over ourselves. And I'm here to, to, today to say we, we shipped this about a month ago, but this is uh, .NET architecture. It's a new website that we have on our .NET homepage. At dot, dot .NET, D-O-T. You go to dot you land here, and you click architecture. And what we have is we have um, a bunch of guidance around if you want to build microservices and Docker apps uh, with .NET. We've got eBooks here. Uh, there's a sample app that you can download and, and try. And there's a lot of technology in these applications around patterns. If you're building containerized applications, how do you do health checks? Um, how do you do queuing? Um, and you're going to see features from those samples actually move into .NET um, as we move forward. Uh, we have another one of these for building web applications. Um, I've got one for building mobile applications with uh, Xamarin and one with deploying uh, uh, to the cloud with Azure. And this is an area you're going to see us continue to invest in, is giving uh, awesome guidance on how to build your apps with .NET. Um, and this is something that I hear when I talk to customers they really want. So happy to do this. That's available today. And there's more coming. Um, this is, I think, probably the biggest one today. Is the biggest thing we hear is there's lots of .NETs out there. There's Xamarin. There's .NET Core. There's .NET Framework. Um, I've got some code I want to share. How do I do that? And uh, we talked about this at Build last year. Um, this is .NET Standard. And the idea here is having you know, a, one set of APIs that you can learn that work across all of our platforms. Take code from all of our platforms and move it back and forth between the various ways you can build applications. Um, and consume lots of third-party OSS out there. Um, this is actually an evolution of portable class libraries, which is the way you did this before. Um, but really, the way this is different is we actually now have a contract. .NET Standard is a contract that a .NET platform must implement. So we actually uh, say, here's all the APIs in the .NET Standard, and .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Xamarin and Unity all have to implement those, those APIs. Um, so this is a big deal, and we're going to do a pretty cool demo in a second on this. Um, this is how this looks. Uh, you can see this is all the .NETs, whether it's Windows Desktop, whether it's the cloud, whether it's Windows UWP, iOS, Android, games, or 3D. All of those get the exact same .NET standard 
uh, across all those. All the same tool chain works. Visual Studio, Visual Studio for Mac, which RTM today, Visual Studio Code. Um, so let's show what this looks like. Well, one, one final slide. This is kind of the stuff just works like you expect it to work. And that's really the, the goal of .NET standard uh, that we're going to ship today is .NET just works like you expect. You have your apps, and you reference code, and that code can reference old code, new code, whatever code, and it works every way you can actually make it go. Can I talk about this for a second? Talk about it. This can be a little bit confusing because it's important to remember, though, that for a lot of us who've been doing .NET for many years, .NET has been one thing. It's been C colon backslash Windows Microsoft.NET, and we all learned the BCL, the base class library, and we read giant books written by people that were about the base class library. What the standard library is, is it's really the standard interface. It's this .NET standard agreement. And there's version 1, and there's version 1.6, and there's version 2.0. It's a lot like Android API levels. You pick the level and the width of that. How much APIs do you want? And then rather than there being one .NET, as he points out in that previous slide, there's instances of .NET. There's Mono, there's .NET Core, there's Unity, there's Xamarin. And all of those then agree to adhere to that. So when you agree on the surface area, good things happen, and we're going to see that right. next. Right. So you know, we'll, we'll talk today about. .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Xamarin all agreeing on um, .NET Standard 2. So how this technically happens, I'll skip this. Let's just do demos. You want to do skip, 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 skip all the slides? They don't want your slides. So uh, when I was starting to do this demo, um, I went and found some old code that I wrote years and years ago. Um, and this is a, a customer app that uses some uh, data from a Northwind database that I exported as an XML file. Um, is that WinForms? Let's see. So That is WinForms. So my laptop is a modern <laughs> Windows 10 laptop uh, with a high DPI screen. And you can see that uh, WinForms has some challenges with high DPI today. That would be a way to phrase it. It's not supposed to look like that. <laughs> but, but we all love WinForms because it's the fastest way to get a button on a form and double click. It's still one of the most popular ways of building apps in, in Visual Studio. We should love it more. And, and so uh, in the Windows 10 wave with mm -hmm. .NET 4.7, yep. uh, we've added high DPI support for this. So let's, let's take this app. All I'm going to do is right click on it, go to properties. Add 15 libraries and two switches and change the config file. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to retarget it to 4.7. Okay. And let's run this app again. Ooh. Ooh. How about that? <clears throat> touche, sir. Touche. So you can take any of your .NET WinForm applications, target them to 4.7, run them on Windows 10, which has a bunch of scaling APIs, let us do this. Um, and you're going to get this great experience. But that tells me that you care about backward compat and things like that. But this API, this, this WinForms app, we all have this app. Uh, it calls maybe data sets and loads some XML from an access database. Yeah, so let's, let's look at that code. <clears throat> this is what this really is. This is an... Oh, you really did make Northwind.xml. Nicely done. This is really Northwind <laughs> XML? Yeah, it can't be 2017 without a Northwind Microsoft demo. I haven't done a Northwind demo since 2007, so Nicely I thought we'd done. have to do a Northwind demo. You made it 10 demo. years. Um, so, you know, along with this .NET standard thing, the next thing I'd want to do is let's go share this code. So okay. let's go create a .NET standard library here. So go into VS. Um, I have the VS 2017 uh, preview, update 3 preview installed, okay. and I have the .NET Core SDK 2 installed. Okay, so you're going to make um, a .NET standard library? So let's go to .NET standard here. Okay. Let's make a standard library, and we'll just call it, how about data layer? I'm just going to move that code out. And then I'm going to take this code, and we'll just drag it. We'll give it a second to figure itself out. I should show one thing here is, is uh, so the, the, but this is a data set, though. I mean, da that's not a .NET. The data set's old, though, right? It is old. Is that um, part of .NET Standard 2? So I am targeting .NET Standard 2.0. Ah. Um, and .NET Standard 2.0 brings back a ton of APIs, including all the data set uh, and data tables. Sweet. So let's just drag that code over here. Now, I'm using a preview build of Visual Studio. You should delete it, too. Let's do that as well. I always tease my boss when we're on stage, because he can only fire me after. <laughs> so the plan is to stay on stage as long as possible. <laughs> so when he, when he drag and drops things, I'm like, that's adorable. Good job, so, boss. So, so let's, 
Notice, Scott, I'm, I'm going to do something here. Right, so it looks like you're going into NuGet and... Uh, uh, bring up the Windows Start menu a couple times. Yeah, that's, that's cool. cool. I'm going to watch circle that of, not once circle to minimize. Of patience there has gone a couple of times. Yeah, let's, let's so you're going to go and pull in a, a co those contracts, that .NET standard contract. So today, in the preview that we have out right now, you have mm -hmm. to actually install this NuGet package um, to actually get .NET standard compliance. Uh, this will be automatic by the tools uh, in the future. So I'm just going to install this NuGet package. This enables my uh, you know, 4.7 application to talk to a .NET standard now, library. To be clear, though, that doesn't mean you're bringing down a 250 meg class file. No, it's, this is that's the agreement that we talked about. That's it's a, the it's interface. A, it's, a, it's a package with a contract inside of it. OK, that's the reference assemblies there. OK? And this will be automatic in the future where you don't Yeah, have once to we get to that. preview two, you'll just actually just reference a .NET standard uh, library, and we'll just bring this in for you automatically. And that so that's no time, so that's cool. That's in, so we're good. And so let's go change the app so it actually references the uh, class library there. So the WinForms app is going to reference the new .NET standard 2.0 library. And you reference it like you reference anything, and that's cool. So <clears throat> and nothing, this is, this nothing. is just showing you can take an old WinForms application, mm -hmm. take a brand new .NET standard uh, 2 library, and share code with each other. Right. Now, the WinForms app still targets what it targeted before. Right. .NET framework. In this case, you made it 4.7 for high DPI support. So it's targeting what it targeted before. This isn't where your app necessarily targets .NET standard. Your library is being consumed because it is now a standard library. Yep. That makes sense. So let's make this more interesting. So <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is go to my solution, and let's add a ASP.NET project. And we're going to add a .NET Core ASP.NET project here. And I'll just make it empty. That's fine. And you're making an ASP.NET Core 2. This is a Core 2 ASP.NET project. Right. We'll have a session on that at 2 o'clock, talk about ASP.NET Core 2, also in preview. Cool. So you made an empty, a Hello World project. This is a Hello World project. Let's go add the same reference back as well. OK, but this is a uh, .NET, this is a cross-platform project, this, this all is, the latest and greatest. Yep, you could run this on Windows, Mac, or Linux. OK. It's, it uh, has no reference on, on Windows. All right. Let's go add our data layer to it. The one that uses data sets and loads XML from a file. Not that we're ashamed of that at all. <laughs> Seriously, though, my blog still runs loading XML as dot, it's dot, uh, .NET 2.0, and it works just great. There's no reason to rewrite something uh, if it oh, works great. Look at that. So you're automatically getting IntelliSense from your .NET standard library, and you're going to go and call that same data layer. And let's... OK, so you have a WinForms app and an ASP.NET Core 2.0, so the latest and greatest, and the less latest and less great. Yes. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking my WinForm app from years and years ago, mm -hmm. wrote some code in there, and I want to build a modern web front end for this now. And I'm going to go take that same exact code, copy it to a .NET standard class library, build a brand new ASP.NET Core project. Boom. Boom. Excellent. Data sets, data tables. So that's. That's binary code reuse. That DLL, you could make it a NuGet package, and it could be shared amongst anyone in your company. You could have packed that up if you wanted to, made it a NuGet package. Exactly. Uh, we'll show that as well. Actually, we should show that. Why don't you show <clears throat> that? So, Because uh, this is about code reuse, right? And this isn't about copy-paste code reviews or copy-pasting from Stack Overflow. The, the, whole point of, yeah, the whole point of .NET Standard is being able to share code back and forth across all your projects. So another cool thing about .NET Standard class libraries is I can come over here, and if I go to my properties, and I go to package, all my NuGet Zoom package in. properties are right here. Zoom in on that. Generate NuGet package on build, right? And you could put that into your existing CI and CD, your continuous integration and deployment system, so that you're popping those out. And you can get as much of your stuff on whatever .NET standard layer is appropriate. If you don't need .NET standard 2, you don't need to use that. You could use 1.6. Right. And that would give you more uh, older um, platforms that you could work on. So from here, I can just take that same project and run pack on it. So you said right-click pack. You don't have to go to right take NuGet this or don't NuGet, NuGet that. that or, yeah. you know, as you saw, I could actually check a box to make it just build a NuGet package every time I actually built the project. Nice. And if I go to my bin folder here, and there, the NuGet package. as David Fowler says, is your nup keg. He's trying to make that a thing, but I'm not so going to allow it. Very simple, easy to do NuGet packages, build them. They're Net Center 2 compliant, all your old APIs. Um, this is a cool slide so here. How many old APIs? 
look here, 20,000 plus new APIs added in .NET Standard 2, which we're previewing today. Uh, basically took the intersection of what all the APIs that were in Xamarin, all the APIs that were in .NET Framework, the ones that intersected between both of those, that's what we actually used to make the contract uh, for .NET Standard. That makes sense. So then it says right there that you can reference also existing .NET Framework binaries, and that shim will go and make those things line up. And assuming that you're not calling one of those outlier APIs, you'll be okay? Another version of the demo that I'm not going to do is mm -hmm. we actually took a, a, a sharp, lib, sharp zip lib, yeah. which is a, a zip library built in 2002. Nice. And I referenced it in this application, used it, works just fine as well. So, and that works in .NET Core as well. I mean, that's... That's so really in cool. this preview, 70% of packages are API compatible. That's pretty fantastic. Pretty cool. Sweet. 70% um, of everything in NuGet runs in .NET Standard now. And the stuff that doesn't is going to be stuff that's like WinForms or WPF, which can't be in something like .NET Standard because it's not, that WinForms doesn't exist on all the platforms. WPF doesn't exist on all the platforms. Uh, but everything else is there. No recompile. Just works. Cool. So those are some of the APIs that are added. And you know, we say it doesn't have everything. You're not going to be calling the registry on Linux, because there isn't one. Um, right now, we do have some gaps around directory services, around bitmaps that we'll look at in the future. But you've got XML, you've got serialization, you've got IO. Uh, a large majority of your stuff should be able to be moved into standard libraries. But again, if you don't need a 2.0 standard library, you can back down. Back in 1.6 or 1.8, and then you could even use those on Windows 7. The big stuff with people that tried to use ASP.NET Core, .NET Core 1.0 was was basically XML serialization, networking. Those are the big big three areas that we had lots of gaps. I all may that I may upgrade from .NET 2 now. I may be ready. It might be time. <clears throat> so another thing we heard was I want to use my existing code with .NET Core. We kind of showed that I want to reference .NET Core like I. Here's the other bosses. You could just you know, shut that down. I tried to earlier. Um, when we switch to you, I will do that. OK. Um, I went to reference .NET Core. We showed all this. Um, he really wants to talk to me. He really wants to talk to me. Here, let's all switch over to 7 real quick, and you can delete that. Why don't you Actually, we away? need to show this slide. So You want to show that? So you know, today, we're going to do a preview of .NET Core 2.0. Um, and the biggest thing in .NET Core 2.0 is it supports .NET Standard 2.0. So if you're building an ASP.NET Core application, Boom. Now you've got most 70% of the APIs that you would have in .NET Framework. Um, another big thing that we've done is you can actually reference the framework as a single package. So one of the challenges we, fought, we found in .NET Core 1.0 was um, it was kind of complicated that you had to have all these packages and you, and, and you didn't know where stuff was. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, .NET Framework, you just went to the add reference and all the framework stuff listed there. Yep. In, in, in uh, NuGet, there's not a great place to see all the stuff that's in .NET. Well, so you want to have a balance between being able to break things up like Node into tiny little libraries, but also, like I mentioned before, those of us that think of the base class library, we just want all of the stuff. So how do you find a balance between a hundred little cafeteria plan and a prefix menu? So we gave you a couple of big prefix menus, mm -hmm. um, and we'll give you technology to actually make your app small anyway, so you can reference all of it and not still so uh, use all of it. Best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, another thing is ASP.NET Core and any framework core are now included uh, in .NET Core. Uh, before, they were actually packages you added on top. And so a great example of this, if you built a ASP.NET Core application on uh, 1.0 and you publish it up to like Antares, Azure, um, what would happen is you would publish ASP.NET every single time because ASP.NET was not part of .NET Core. OK, but by adding it, though, in my mind, I'm thinking you're making it really big and it's going to make my applications too big. I don't want them to be giant. No. We will let you make your application small as well, which we'll talk, to, talk about right. later today. Um, the other cool stuff, which we're going to talk a little bit le later as well, is we have automatic diagnostics in ASP.NET Core. Uh, this means if anybody in the, in the room has actually tried VS and, in, and went to File New and it said, hey, install App Insights, and you had to click a box and it you know, morphed your app or whatever, we've done a bunch of work. We don't have to do that kind of stuff anymore. Where we can actually give you the benefits of that technology without doing that. We have Razor Pages, which uh, Scott and uh, Daniel are going to talk about the next uh, session. And we have an ADA Framework Core. So I'm going to let Scott take over. I'll show one thing. Here's that package reference stuff. Here's what an ASP.NET Core application looks like in 1.0. Notice you have to know um, ASP.NET Core MVC, static files, logging, debug. I don't know that stuff. I could not type that stuff from command line. Here's what it looks like in 2.0. How about that? <laughs> the goal is you shouldn't have to use Visual Studio to write apps. You should be able to write these things from hand. And this is simple. I reference .NET Core 2, and I reference ASP.NET All. Boom. Done. OK, so I'm going to switch to you. Cool. You so something that I am excited about, because I'm all about the side-by-side. -side. This is my machine. And if I go over to 
C program files .net. In the past, you may have seen me do demos where I run .NET and I delete one of those folders in .NET Core, and you see the version change, because removing .NET Core is as easy as removing one of those folders. Now, right now, if I type in .NET dash dash version, I've got this version right now. So I want to let you know, this is kind of a more of an FYI than a warning. If you go and install uh, .NET 2 Preview that's coming out today, if you type .NET dash dash version, it's going to show you that the, the latest version is that one. So you might right, freak out because you work on 1.0 or 1.1 in your daily life, right? And uh, when I type, when I also go ahead and make a folder called Fancy Pants, oops, uh, super fancy pants. Fancy pants too. Well, I've made a lot of fancy, that's a fa fancy pant. It's more of just a singular pant. Um, <laughs> If I go and say .NET new console, okay, it's going to run restore, by the, by the way, automatically. And we look at that CS proj, by default, it's going to make a 2.0 application. There's a couple ways I can get around that if I want to maintain compatibility. I'm going to go ahead and just toss that. So that is an empty folder now. I can say .NET new console dash dash framework net core app 1.1, okay? And now I have a 1.1 application, OK? When I type where.net, it's still the same one. It's that 2.0.1. So I'm actually getting benefits of the newer CLI, but I'm doing the work here in 1.1. In I want to point out, though, that the way that I did that is actually quite clever. Then we'll, I'll, we'll write blog posts and docs about all this kind of stuff. What we're doing is you've got those extendable templates. .NET new has extendable templates. So I took .NET 2.0, core 2.0, and I've got the project templates, and I just said there I want the 1.0 project templates. That means that when I type .NET new at the command line, I've got a whole bunch of choices about what I could do, C sharp, F sharp, and then I can pass in dash dash framework and pass in a version for those things that already exist, which is pretty sweet. One other thing that's worth pointing out, if I go back to my desktop, I've got this global.json here. Let's make a super... I can't type. You are watching. That's going to be creepy to find that on your desktop. Um, and I'm going to copy that global JSON over to here. So I just have a global.json. And all that file does is it says, hey, I want SDK version 103. It's an empty file, OK, empty folder here. If I go and say .NET dash dash version, it says 103. But I go back to my desktop and I say .NET dash dash version, it says 2.0. So if you're conscious about the folders that you're in, about the ability to either make the templates or want, you can mess around with this stuff and still keep doing your work and having all kinds of fun. Is that cool? All right, I'm going to assume that your silence indicates intense shock and approval, <laughs> which is exactly what we were going for. No, we don't want your pity applause. We're going to earn that applause, and we will earn that applause with this next talk. Pressure. Pressure. Did you know I was switching back to you? We're looking at I you. I knew screen. that you were. Fabulous. So, Casey? So, uh, <clears throat> another big thing we hear from customers all the time is, um, the way I like to say this is, today to be productive in Visual Studio, a lot of folks feel like they have to install a lot of extensions and stuff like that. Um, and we want to get it where you don't have to install a lot of third-party extensions, so you get a great experience built into Visual Studio, save memory. Um, another thing is, we shipped something called LiveNet testing um, in March uh, with VS 2017. And it did not support .NET Core. And, and uh, we've heard people want uh, live unit testing for core. So I'm just going to recap really quickly. Uh, with VS 2017, we just shipped a few months ago, um, much better improvements uh, in, in performance of the, of the application. The install experience lets you actually install what you want. Um, we built a bunch of productivity around navigating. And, and Casey's going to show a few of those. Being able to actually set the style of your code and, and enforce it. We did live unit testing, which actually lets you run live uh, testing run your unit test as you type instead of actually waiting to run them manually. We actually figure out which test we have to rerun and stuff like that. A ton of IntelliSense improvements, um, C Sharp 7, and so on. Uh, with the preview of v VS 2017 update 3 that's coming out today, we have a bunch of new stuff uh, that uh, Casey's going to go into, and I'll let you talk about this. Cool. Uh, thanks, Scott. So y'all might have noticed that my hair is slightly, just slightly more glamorous than Scott's. 
Uh, and so it's not easy doing this. Unlike Beyonce, you know, I don't wake up like this. Uh, and so every morning it's a struggle to figure out how long it's going to take me to have presentable hair that doesn't look like I've been electrocuted in the morning uh, before my bus comes to work. So today I've written a, yeah, it's on the screen, .NET Core 2.0 app that's going to tell me when the next three arrival times of my bus is in the morning so that I know how long I have to get my hair to be better than Scott's. Um, so here I'm in Visual Studio. That should not be. <laughs> Visual Studio 2017 uh, Update 3 Preview. Uh, we've added a ton of new features and experiences to make you more productive. Uh, the first one I'm going to show is file globbing. Uh, and really what file globbing is going to allow you to do is take a file like this direction file, and I can just copy it into my class library. And if you're looking over here in the Solution Explorer, you should almost instantaneously uh, see the direction file appear here. Let me make sure that I actually, yep, there it is. And so it popped up here. And so this is great when you're in source control, you add files, remove files. Rather than having to make sure you're in sync, we now do this for you automatically. We also have more lightly, lightweight projects. So for example, I can now right click and immediately edit the CS proj file without having to unload my project. Yeah. <laughs> And then, as Scott showed you earlier, the CSProj file is a lot simpler and smaller now. Uh, the things I just showed you are for .NET Core projects only right now. Uh, you can pester Scott, uh, but we're planning to move these to other project types as well in the future. Uh, so what else is new? So Scott mentioned in March we released the RTM version of Visual Studio 2017, and there we mentioned uh, the enterprise feature live unit testing. Uh, and now, in update three, I'm happy to say, it now has support for .NET Core apps. Uh, let's go full screen here. So what is live unit testing? Live unit testing removes all of the manual steps from unit or running your unit tests. So typically, developers have to figure out what is that set of tests we want to run. We manually press a button to run the test, and then we navigate to some explore window to figure out the results of those tests. Well, live unit testing automates almost all of this and keeps you in the context of your development by placing these icons on the left-hand side of your editor. So a red X means this line of code is hit by at least one failing test. A green check means this line of code is hit by all passing tests. And a blue dash means this line of code is not covered by any tests at all. I can click on an icon to see exactly what tests are hitting this line, and I can double-click to navigate directly to my test. So I don't really know why this test is failing, so I'm just going to go ahead and start debugging it. Visual Studio 2017 has a ton of new debugger features, which you should check out Casey Anderson's talk later this week to see all of them. Uh, and the one that I'm going to show you today is the new exception helper. The new exception helper works to put the most important information at the top level. So you can see here I threw a null reference exception. And of course, like, I want to know why I threw this. And so now we're going to tell you at the top level what variable is returning null. Yeah. So now that I know that this parameter can be null, rather than having to manually add if lat equal equal null, all this stuff, I can just use one of the many quick actions and refactorings that we've put into Visual Studio 2017 update three preview, and there's a ton in 2017 as well. I can access these with control dot, which pulls up my light bulb menu, and you can see now that we can add a null check for your parameters here immediately, so I don't have to do any work, and so I can do it for both parameters. And if you're looking on the left-hand side, you'll notice that live unit testing figured out what tests were impacted by this code change, ran them for me, and updated these icons to let me know that now all my unit tests are passing. So we know many of you install third-party extensions into Visual Studio to get a productive and fun experience. And so in Visual Studio 2015, we, uh, we brought about Roslyn, which is the .NET compiler platform. Uh, with Roslyn, we're able to really raise the bar of what we're able to do in an IDE today so that you can be productive right away inside Visual Studio. So some of the things that we've done in 2017 to make you productive right away, uh, the first one is Control-T, or go to all. Go to all lets you quickly navigate to any file, type, 
member, or symbol declaration from a single location. So I want to know, right now I know I want to navigate to my stop file. So I can type stop and I see everything at first, or I can filter it by just using the query syntax with F for file. And now I can na uh, directly navigate there. So it turns out when you uh, are trying to catch a bus, buses can like run north or south or east or west. And so to make sure I'm actually taking the bus to work rather than from work, I need to add a direction to my stop constructor. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna access that direction class that I added earlier with file globbing. And you'll notice that now Visual Studio is suggesting a variable name for me. So it saw I was typing a parameter of type direction and it's offering direction as a good name for me to put here, which is a new feature in Visual Studio uh, Update 3 Preview. So I can add that. From here, I can now add a parameter with control dot. So now it's gonna create the property for me and I can do control dot one more time to add the null check for that parameter that I just added. And so this whole new workflow of quickly adding a parameter is something that we've added in Visual Studio 2017 Update 3. Yeah. I'm just gonna quickly add my um, deserialization stuff. So type of, you can notice in IntelliSense we have camel case matching, so I can just add this in here. Uh, and now you can notice that live unit testing is telling me this is, un like all of this is uncovered because I've changed my constructor. So now I'm just gonna go find all references and update all my constructors, or all my uses of stop to now have this new parameter. You'll notice that find all references is now colorized to help you read this so it's the same color as all of your code inside the editor. Uh, and we also allow you to group your results. So if you have a bajillion results in here, you can now sort them however you want. So I'm just gonna double click in here. I'm just going to add a new direction. Northwest is the way I need to get to work. Uh, and you'll notice that live unit testing is gonna update and let me know that all my tests are now passing without me having to do anything again. So I wanna draw your attention to these gray dots that you might be seeing under the var keyword here. It's blurs, aren't they? Yeah, it's not a smudge. Smudges. It's They're not smudges. a smudge. It's there on purpose. It is a code suggestion that we've added in Visual Studio 2017. Code suggestions allow you to indicate best practices or alternate coding patterns to developers. <laughs> So I can investigate these by, again, pressing control dot. And you can see here that's telling me to use the explicit type instead of var. This is because my team is using the new Visual Studio 2017 code style configuration and enforcement feature where we have an editor config file where we can set all of our team's coding conventions and have it enforced across the entire repository. So to apply this, I can just press enter. And when I do this, you'll notice that I've unveiled, I'm using C Sharp 7's Tuples. Tuples allow you to return multiple values from a method. So here I'm returning both a route and a stop. Uh, and I've, I've also optionally named my parameters, so rather than, or my tuple elements, so rather than, rather than them being item one and item two, they have more meaningful names. And again, I have a code suggestion here. Smudge. I have a smudge. I change the color to pink, by the way, usually, away from the default gray, so you can see it better. Uh, but if, you can also ignore them more easily if they're gray. Uh, and so you can see here, it's telling me to use the more explicit tuple name. Uh, and so I can do that in one click. So it's also refer, oops, it's telling me to use uh, more, it's telling me to embrace the C-sharp language features in these code suggestions as well. So what's an example of a best practice where it's telling me like a better API design or better performance or security uh, for my app? Well, in Visual Studio 2017 Update 3, when it releases, we're going to release a preview v6 of the FX cop rules written as live code analyzers, meaning you'll see squiggles in the editor indicating these best practices uh, through FX cop. So I can navigate to one of them here. And you can see I have a code suggestion under this class name. If I investigate it, it's telling me, hey, there's an FX cop violation here. You have all static members in this class, so you should go ahead and make this class static so that you can't accidentally instantiate it. And then a single click, it now comes with a fix for my FX cop violation, uh, so I can apply this immediately. 
And these are really cool because I showed these last year at Build, mm -hmm. and, and they were kind of a preview, but unlike FSCOP where you ran it statically and then had to go and just read the suggestion and do it by hand, right. now this is dynamic. It's actually doing the code fix for me, mm -hmm. and I can configure on or off which of these I want uh, right. throughout the entire project. Yeah, and the V6 will come with about like 100 or so of these FXCOP rules in it, so you can really uh, improve your code base with these things. Uh, and you'll notice this entire demo I've had live unit testing running on a .NET Core 2.0 app, and it's automatically found all the places I needed to run the test, ran them for me, and kept me in the context of my development so that I don't lose any productivity. And your machine did not melt down either. And my machine's still running. Yay! Uh, so these are just some of the cool productivity features that we've added in Visual Studio 2017. Uh, and we can't wait to hear what you think. Thanks. We guys think. <laughs> Casey. Do you want me to take this down? Yeah. Uh, to highlight what Casey said, um, and there's links in the, in the deck that will be available at, after the presentation, um, we actually have a, uh, for people that are using ReSharper today and stuff like that, we actually have a sheet sheet that we built that shows you all the commands um, in VS and how they map to some of the other extensions you might use today. Full cheat sheet here. Everybody loves cheat sheets. All right. What's next, boss? So next, next is, one of the things we heard is, you know, Scott and I got on stage a year ago and we're out here talking about you can build .NET Core projects with command line, you can build them with Visual Studio, um, and now we're happy to say that you can also build .NET Core apps with Macs. That's something we heard is people want to build, build .NET Core apps on Macs, and really they want to round trip their applications between VS for, or Visual Studio for Windows and Visual Studio for Mac. It's got some developers on Macs, some on, yep. on Windows, and they all want to play together. And so uh, this morning we announced the uh, RTM, a Visual Studio for Mac. Um, what's cool for me to, to <clears throat> as somebody that works in the, in the .NET tooling side, um, our goal here is to provide the exact same experience across both uh, Mac and Windows. Um, and to do that, we're actually sharing a whole bunch of components between both of these IDEs. One thing is the .NET Core templates are the exact same templates between both of the IDE IDEs. We are actually code sharing as well. So if you're used to the great IntelliSense that we have for HTML, CSS, and JSON, those exact editors, the exact same source code from Visual Studio has been dropped into Visual Studio for Mac. And so you're using the same editor code. And, and we're, we just started with those, those editors. The JavaScript editor is coming, coming next, and so will the Razor editor for ASP.NET. So you're gonna get the exact same experiences. We have the same backend debugger across both of these environments, and we have the same Azure publish infrastructure. Um, if you played with Visual Studio 2017, there's a bunch of features like Docker, Docker support. Uh, Visual Studio for Mac has the exact same Docker support. You can build a .NET Core application, build it and run it inside of a Docker container. You can debug it in the container. That's all built in. You can publish to app service. You can publish to app service for containers. And it has support for Azure Functions. So we're trying to actually have parity between these two things. And uh, I think we have a demo that we're going to do. That's all about. talk. I don't want to see slides. I want to see the reality. So let me click over to seven here while you set up that machine right there for me. So this is my computer, and I want to just kind of double click on what he just said there. If you recall, there's been a couple of cool demos that we've done. When we were, try when we were trying to get Hello World to work, you might recall back when it was called ASP.NET 5 or whatever, we'd go to the command line, we'd go, Hello World, and then I'd put it on a USB key, and I pulled a Mac out of the audience that had never uh, had it before, and we got Hello World, and we knew that that was, gonna, that was the moment. I want you to think about that for a second, because some of you may have seen that. We said, hello, world, on a PC. I put it on a USB key, and then we walked it over to a Mac, and we all said, it's a brave new world. Well, this is Visual Studio 2017 on my uh, Windows machine, and this is a non-trivially sized <laughs> application. Okay? It's got microservices, it's got a web app, it's got a data layer. This is the big sample app that we used in the keynote. And I have copied it while onto... You're while you're chatting, give me the memory stick. I've oh. copied onto this memory stick. You can see it disappeared as I handed it to the boss man. And what he's going to do is take that non-trivially sized application, and he's going to pop it over onto his Mac and load it up into uh, Visual Studio for the Mac and see what kind of damage he can do. Okay. Okay, so he's got it on his <clears throat> desktop there. He's copied it over, and he's got this solution file. He's got a beautiful icon. I'm not sure why their icon is prettier than our icon. Uh, and he's just going to double-click on that. And so as you said, this is a multi-project, yep. large solution. 
application, multiple projects, got unit tests, got a ton of stuff, opens up Visual Studio for Mac. You've got, you've still got a preview build, but uh, you should probably upgrade. It came out today, did you hear? And uh, last time I checked, you're not supposed to update your build right before a talk. Yeah, you shouldn't update your build until after your talk, it's true. So it's restoring those NuGet packages on the left-hand side. You can see that whole solution and all projects within it, some of which were .NET standard projects, some of which were ASP.NET Core projects, some had APIs, some have Razor. Look at that, it's all right there. Open up dependencies, by the way, because it's, it's very pretty. The dependencies uh, dial, uh, oh, the, you purple, yeah. the purple thing? Look at that. It's just like VS, by the way. It's just like, because it is. Because people might say, oh, well, you just reskinned the, you know, no, this is, a, this is new to prove to you that this is not just something that's been reskinned. Check this out. So he can go and do his debugging. He can do his, uh, his, his, all his things that he wants to do. But what can you do that we haven't seen before? How can well, you actually, let's just run the app. Let's just prove the app actually works first. They believe us. <laughs> Unless it doesn't. And then if yellow screen of death here would be hilarious. No, it did work because I wasn't lying. <clears throat> Same visitor app, right from the, the Windows PC. Yep, click running on here on the to Mac. prove the data. To talk to the database. Boom. All right, good. That's the same app. That's the one from the, this morning. And we're sharing that. We're sharing that code. Could be in Git or on a USB key that you just pass back and forth between, <laughs> between you and your boss. Just don't. It's just kind of an exclusive checkout kind of a thing. So as we were saying earlier, um, notice there is, there is a, a, a .NET I need, I need Core. I need a bug. Can I have the USB key? Yeah. No, just. No, just <laughs> There is a, uh, a .NET Core section here, and if I click it, you're going to see the same ASP.NET Core templates that you saw um, elsewhere, right in, in VS for Mac. Uh, unit tester here as well. We'll zoom back out here. There's console as well. Let's go build a ASP.NET Core web application, and we'll just call this build demo. Create it over here. Or buid. Yeah, you can stop that other project. It's fine. Um, so, and so once this opens up, real. looks just like VS, as Scott was saying before. Uh, but I want to show it's just not just uh, it's not just an editor that like, editor it's not just Xamarin all those, Studio all with the Visual Studio logo well. on it. Um, I have other cool things here as well. I can I should be able to come over here and say I want to add. Look at that. There's add Docker support. Mm. So I can Dockerize this application on the Mac. Urgh. And let's make it even crazier. Let's go into our controller. And let's put a breakpoint in our about action method here. So you added Docker support, got a Docker Compose as a separate project that could have then multiple Docker projects. And now you're going to? Yeah, there's your Docker Compose. Yeah. We're good to go. And now I'm going to say, let's start debugging. Presume that you have the Docker on your Mac. And so what's going to happen is this should actually go and kick off. Uh, you can see it up here where it says building Docker Compose, build successful. There's your breakpoints and your call stack and all the stuff you expect from a fine IDE that just popped up at the bottom there. going to take it a second for the container to boot up. Here's my browser. What's our port number? It should be now, something let's crazy go, let's go, Docker. Let's go look at the terminal here real quick. Prove and it. let's do Docker PS-A. Yep, 23 seconds ago, forwarded so from That is the port. build demo app that I just built running in a container. OK. Um, there's the container image right there. And did you say you had a breakpoint, though? Let's go to about. Nice. And so full Docker support, full debugger support in containers on the Mac, just like on Windows, same experience, both products. We're not going to go into it further than that, but, but uh, I could also publish to Azure. That would actually publish to Azure containers uh, in app service. Um, so basically, as, as we're saying, all the features that you have on the Windows VS, we are putting on. It is worth pointing out, though, the difference there, that uh, on stage, before I right-clicked and I said publish to Azure, and it was going into Azure app service, and it was going to go and run on Windows in, in Azure. Because he added a Docker file, Visual Studio for Mac is smart about that, and it would send it to web, Azure Web Apps for Linux. On Linux containers. So it, it would actually send the Docker file up to that, like we saw where Maria showed that there's a private container registry. Yeah. Cool. Let's go back to three. All right. And three. OK, VS for Mac. Um, another one is. Um, and I'm going to let you start on this one with the web, because I'm going to have to boot up the uh, SnapPoint stuff. 
Um, one of the biggest things that we hear as, as developers is, you know, all of us are moving our apps to the cloud. And once you move your app to the cloud, it's not easy, as easy to diagnose and debug as you, you, you can locally uh, until today. Um, and we hear that you know, people want great uh, serverless uh, support for building .NET apps in Azure as well. But the big thing is, here's the thing that I think about. Um, we could talk to customers. They want to be able to take their application and publish up to Azure. And then when they see errors in it, they just want to go turn diagnostics on. Turning diagnostics on does not mean calling a developer and saying, can you go add a bunch of packages to my project? Can you go instrument my project? C can you republish my project? I want to just go to the portal and enable diagnostics. So with some of the bits that we're shipping today, you can take your application, add no app insights, add no new relic, add no nothing to it, publish it up to Azure. And when you're in the portal in Azure, there'll be a, a bar that shows up that says enable diagnostics. And that will actually turn app insights on that will turn a feature called the service pro profiler on for your application, um, and we'll start doing all the diagnostics for you automatically. Um, so that is no code changes, nothing. Uh, you, you get that stuff. Um, the next big thing is, it, once you have logs in the, in the portal, that's great. I can see lots of logs. But really, a lot of our apps log a lot. Mm -hmm. um, do you really want to scroll through 7,000 lines of logs to go find out what's wrong with your application? Probably not. And so. As part of this, what we do is we actually have some AI running uh, in the portal. It actually it hooks a small profiler to your application, and it starts watching your app. And if it sees pages that crash a lot, um, it goes, hey, maybe there's a problem there, and I should take a snapshot of that. If it sees a page that actually runs for like half a second, many, many times, and then starts taking 10 seconds, there's a performance problem there. It takes a snapshot. Um, and all these snapshots are available live in the portal, um, and Scott's going to show that in a second. And even cooler is, with these snapshots, you'll actually be able to see not just the area of your app that's having a problem, you'll be able to see the source code, the lines, the call stack, the variables. You'll see all of that live in the portal, and you can download that same information to Visual Studio. So I'm going to switch to you. So let me switch over to here while you set up your machine. While I set up the snap points. Cool. So this is the same exact uh, app that we were looking at in the keynote, but since we have more time, we can talk about it. And it's really important to point out that when what Hunter said is really true, that in the past, it's go into NuGet, add a reference to whatever your favorite diagnostic package is, whether it be New Relic or App Insights or Raygun, and then add a dependency on that thing to your application and basically turn it on and instrument your code. We'd like you to be able to just have your application know that it's running in the cloud. The cloud knows an application showed up, of course. Why doesn't the cloud light those things up? So our partners will be able to go and plug those things in. We just published the application up into the cloud. App Insights gives you a ton of information. Now, this here is the application map. And what's cool about this is, like, when I saw this, actually, for the first time, I thought it was fake. The it's reason this exists, if you've used Azure today, you get a list of all the resources that you have in Azure. Nothing shows you how those resources actually interact with each other, how they depend this, on each other. This, it's just a this, random this, this. pile of stuff. Right. Azure, in the past, years ago, it's like, here's a list of the crap that your app is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, enjoy. <laughs> Welcome to the cloud. App Insights is looking at your application, and it sees you called that <coughs> SQL. It sees how many times you did it and the average time it took. You see that? It knows that you made an HTTP, HTTP call because it is attached to that stack. And I can then change the focus onto that call and then see, well, what did that call? And how long did that take? And what percentage of those were errors? It, so this whole thing scales out. In fact, this is quite a bit larger than you'd think. It depends on which node you've decided to focus on. That SQL actually can see both App Insights on your local and on your uh, production. What, zoom back in for, for a second on that. What do you want to see? Uh, I see a warning icon. Yes, that's because that, something bad has happened. So that, Click that, to investigate. That's another problem. Anybody's tried Azure today and you've got like you know a web front end, you've mm -hmm. got a bunch of APIs exactly. and a database. How would you know what's working well and what's not working so well? So here, 0% failures. Here, 3% failures. So when we go and click on that, we can see what's failing. It looks like it's failing up here before it gets down into the web API. You see the CRM API popped up. Something went wrong. On the right-hand side here, what it does is it buckets the problems. It sees them, and it says those are all related and puts them in a bucket. So here are 132 things that are the same problem happening multiple times. You can see index out of range exception. 
These are also problems, but they're kind of rare. And then there's one on a web API where I have an issue. But I'm going to focus on the bad stuff first. This has been top errors. I can certainly select star from errors, errors. if I wish to. But let's go ahead and look in here. Now, this is crazy. I, I say this sincerely because I just I remember, well, I'm old is what it really means. I remember how we are standing on the shoulders of giants and how manual this stuff was. I mean, I've, I've gone, I've driven into the network and worked at the bank when like Katrina happened to go and like, the bank, the bank is down. Let's go and see which hard drive failed. And you're looking at the rack. Like, I remember that. And the idea that we're in the cloud and we're mad when clicking it takes a second. Like, oh, this is taking a second. Blah. But you didn't have to go find a diagnostic log. You didn't have to go find errors. or anything. Look at this. It's failed method from San Antonio, Texas at this location. Show telemetry. Now, this is crazy. Show telemetry five minutes before and after this event, because it might be something around the time that that happened, right? Just, just I don't know, being old is great, because you have so much context about what's going wrong. And even better, because you're old and you're a manager, you just say, new work item, and then you assign it to somebody else. <laughs> So with the click of a mouse, I've delegated, and I can hit the links uh, if I knew how to play golf. Um, I can scroll down to the bottom here, and I can actually see the call stack with the line that it happens. Now, I've turned on show just my code, which is a feature that you're familiar with because it's a Visual Studio thing. Your brain knows about the just my code feature. Then I can hit open debug snapshot. Now, I want to point out to what Scott said. It's not just a list of stuff that went wrong. It's a sorted list of stuff that went wrong uh, with the best exemplars of those things pulled out. It's not a list of a million exceptions. It's the top ones and those dumps stored in your storage and you control. It's a mini snapshot. It's a mini snapshot. Take, it's a dump. Um, and, and we store it. You can open it uh, in the portal and mm -hmm. view it in the portal. Right. Um, and once you actually open it in the portal, you can also then decide to download it to Visual Studio and open the same thing in Visual Studio. And the dump file is kind of big. So to save time, I'm not going to go and download the 2 gig or whatever size it is. I'm going to switch over to you. Um, and, and when I switch over to, let's talk about something else. Uh, this is great. I saw that information. This is great. I love it. I'm, I'm very happy with that. That's awesome. What? Um, but sometimes something? that's not good enough. Even all that information is great. But maybe I need to actually debug the application. Yeah, live. But, but you don't want to live debug a cloud app because you don't want to break your customers. When um, I like to. Debug, and so, I do it in production. And so I've got the, the visitor app running here um, in app service. And if I click some of these things, I, I get some errors. Do you know that Jeff Atwood from Stack Overflow calls RDPing into production, Hanselmaning into production? <laughs> but you saw true, I got that true error story. there. True story. And um, so how would I diagnose that error? So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'm going to open that project in Visual Studio. And we showed a little bit in the keynote mm -hmm. uh, this notion of something we call snap points. Yes. And so breakpoints are when your application actually breaks, all execution stops, and you take over, and you're a developer, and you get to muck around with the application. Snap points, instead, are us telling the cloud, when you hit this line, what we want you to do is take one of these same snapshots that we're showing in the portal a second ago right. uh, directly live for you. So here I am. Kind of like going into Task Manager and right-clicking and saying Create Dump, except it doesn't stop anything. It's instantaneous. It's almost like, uh, like time splits and production continues doing their job. The user is unchanged. And now a little kind of Goldfinger mini plane breaks off from the larger plane, takes off, and then that is now the snap point that you will debug. That's my mixed analogy. So let's, let's go over here to debug. And notice there's this new thing, launch snapshot debugger. Uh, my old standard debugging stuff is there like it always has been. But well, now it's not, it's not old. It's awesome. We just saw Casey show it. Yeah, it's old. Because it was an hour ago that we shipped it. Um, <clears throat> things are moving fast at Microsoft. The cloud moves very fast. Okay, um, so snapshot's been added into the debug menu that I'm already familiar with. And so um, I click that. And as I click that, notice what this bar says um, up here. Right. So it's telling me it went and sent that command to, to, you know, it's now hooked up to, to Azure. And let's go grab, let's try update for, for this one here. So let's go grab the update method. And let's put a snap point in the update method right there. Now, he's setting those snap points, but they don't get sent 
to Azure until he clicks Start Collection. So you got to think about it. You've you've sent you set these moments in time. I want to know a little about this, this, and this. I'm suspicious of this general area. Click, click, click. Then he says Start Collection. Azure is now watching, and the intelligent part of intelligent snapshotting is listening. And production continues. The work continues. He's still doing his stuff in production. Everyone is doing their stuff. So he goes and, I don't know, does some stuff. The app, and an error happens silently, maybe. The app isn't, it's not broken, right? The app hasn't paused, because this is not debugging. This is snapshot debugging, right? The app is continuing, even though he is doing that work. And you notice that nothing is pulling your focus back over into Visual Studio. Visual Studio is just chilling. But my snap point did not hit, so. Why did your snap point not hit? Did you hit I, the wrong? I don't know. Did you hit the wrong button? No, we were doing the right thing. Maybe it was null. Hit 108 as well. And then maybe that would be the second one never been, because visitor is always null. So do that. I love that it's your demo and not my demo. <laughs> Collection updated, but no snap points. Oh, well. Jacques. Crazy bait. It was a crazy demo anyways. Well, but, it wasn't uh, a crazy demo. I just did it on stage. Did you see I, the keynote? I saw. <laughs> we're, down to, we're down to five minutes, so. Um, we're not going to do this demo, but, but another, another cool one is, is uh, Azure, Azure Functions. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of hype today about writing uh, serverless code, mm -hmm. where you don't actually write a, a full web app. You just write a snippet of code, you put it up in the cloud, and you run it. <clears throat> right, there's been a lot of times where I'll go and make an app and I'll have a function called do it and I'll wrap it in an ASP.NET MVC thing and I'll return it from a web API. It's but overkill. I just we, want the do it to happen in the cloud. We do the same thing in WinForms. You write a WinForm app with a button with and the you button. Write some code in the button. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I did that um, yesterday. And so Azure Functions is a great story for this. <clears throat> and one of the cool things about Azure Functions and .NET is Visual Studio support. <clears throat> you okay? If I just go, yeah, I'm if I just go to the portal and I, I write, it, write some, a function in the portal, that's great, but I lose all the power of Visual Studio. By using VS, I can actually write functions live in VS. I'm not going to demo it because we don't have time, um, but I have it loaded here. Um, I can write a function in VS. I can actually uh, debug it locally. Mm -hmm. So I can run it locally um, and debug it. I can then publish it to Azure and remote debug it. So I get debugging both locally and remote um, with Visual Studio. We also, this, there's a change we made as well. You might notice this, this function is now a class. Yep. Um, and I, and I, wanna, I wanna actually point out something cool here. Notice he's got that Q trigger there, right? So run is the name of the function. He's got the function name around it, and he's got Q trigger. So when that Q happens, when something drops into that Q, that's gonna be a trigger for Azure Functions to go and just, run that thing. Just runs so it. think about the kinds of classic problems that we've had to, to solve. Let's say that someone gave you a million TIFF files and said, spin through those TIFF files and OCR them and make a PDF. Classic for each problem. You're like, for loop, I know that. And then you realize it's six terabytes of TIFFs and it's gonna take until the sun death of the universe to, <laughs> to do that. And you know, your laptop is underpowered because you have an old laptop that your boss gave you. And instead, you write the do it. The circle of patience. You write that do it, and you put it up into the cloud. And then there's a slider bar, basically, that says it's directly connected to your credit card. How much money do you got? How much compute do you want? You drop those TIFF files into the queue, and it starts to pop up. It's a naively parallel problem. You have a million of those. They're not dependent on each other. Let's go and have as many of those things chunk off as you want. But you just wrote the do it. It's such a great and model. I was going to show it went before VS crashed. Uh, we have like 15 templates of do it's that are built in there to do all right. kinds of variety of things. Trigger based, things coming in on an HTTP, web hooks for GitHub, time, GitHub bots, time based timer schedules. bases, batches. It's all that stuff where you just want something to happen, and you want something to happen n times or on some event that happens in the cloud. And before, on Azure Functions, you did it in the portal inside of a little text box, and now you've got Visual Studio support coming, and that crashed because it's a preview, yeah. coming later this year. Yes. Um, let's talk about what's coming next in .NET. Um, preview of .NET Core 2 today, uh, but there's still big areas that we care about. Faster inner loop. That's how fast it takes you to actually change some code and run your application. We want to get that smaller and smaller and smaller. 
We want to let you build small standalone apps. Today I showed with .NET Core 2, we added all those APIs back. You might be, is my app going to get bigger? Yep. Um, so we're going to give you tools where we can actually link out the bits of .NET you're not using. Uh, so your app. So will, even though I reference all of this stuff, reference it the planets, trim, trims out the things we'll I don't. We'll trim out everything you don't. Sweet. We still want to do native. Uh, where you can actually build .NET native applications for core, be yep. it ASP.NET Core, .NET Core. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to, uh, we want to do work in machine learning and, and uh, uh, AI. Uh, global tools, being able to install .NET Core tools directly, just you know, yep. NuGet install, and you're you're good. Yep. Um, better support for IoT and ARM ARM32. Uh, I'm going to show a slide here about Samsung. Samsung is building their Tizen platform on ARM32 on .NET Core. Nice. Um, we want to make that available to everybody. Uh, so let's do the last thing here. This is just showing the, our our friends at Samsung. Um, they are building uh, Tizen, I said on .NET Core. And so that means later this year, you'll be able to buy Samsung TVs and refrigerators and watches and stuff like that. They're all going to have .NET in them. So that's my excuse to my wife. I'm an, we need a new TV because it has .NET. Um, I'm going to expense that. Yeah. <laughs> um, big thing here is uh, we have .NET Conf coming up uh, September 19th to the 21st. Uh, that'll be a, a three days of activity of Microsoft people and community folks all training and talking about how to use .NET, .NET Core. Xamarin, uh, so a great event coming up this year. Please come. Virtual, virtual. Virtual, event. just you know, book a room for the day and, and watch. Cool. And um, all this stuff that we showed today is available today. All right, that is our talk. Make sure you go to dot.net, dot.net. We paid for that domain. It's important that you use it. And be sure to check out our other talks we've got. We've got the future of C Sharp later. We've got uh, introducing ASP.NET Core 2.0 with myself. In 30 minutes. In, uh, not in 30 minutes. It's actually 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. I have to go to Chipotle. And there's also SignalR. And we'll hear about SignalR as well. So thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, guys.